Hello, welcome everybody. It's good to see you. Um, I'm Adnan Hussein, and I teach in the history department here and direct the School of Religion and also the Muslim Society's Global Perspectives Project here at Queen's University. And as I'm sure you all know, it is Islamic History Month because it is October. And so as a result, we have a number of events. We run events throughout the year, but especially during October to commemorate and celebrate Islamic History Month. And we have five events uh, this month. Um, two of them are today, and I'll introduce um, our speaker and those events in a moment. But I just want to tell you that if you're interested in Ms. Marvel uh, and want to talk about uh, the semiotics and meaning of uh, female observant Muslim superhero and the kind of corporate appropriation of that for Disney, uh, we'll be having a watch party and discussion, panel discussion with Sailaja Krishnamurti from uh, the head of gender studies, my colleague Shobana Xavier in uh, the School of Religion, who teaches a course on religion and popular culture and is a specialist on Muslims in North America and Sufism, and myself. And it'll be, you know, I think a fun discussion. There'll be pizza, uh, so do come out for that on October 18th. And at the end of the month, we have uh, Dr. Lori Silvers, who was a medieval uh, Islamic uh, historian of religion and Sufism and women in like the ninth century Baghdad, but she became a fiction writer and has been writing a quartet called the Sufi Mysteries Quartet, which is a series of murder mysteries, detective stories, genre bending, but uh, set in ninth century Baghdad. So we're gonna have a conversation with her about history and fiction and what's the purpose of her, of her work um, and so on. And as well as in the evening, there'll be a reading from a forthcoming novella called Rat City. Um, and it's about uh, a black slave rebellion in southern Iraq in the 10th century and what would have happened if it had been more successful. So that should be very interesting. If you wanna know about these events and other events coming up in the future, connect with us. We have a variety of ways you can do that. There are sheets with a QR code circulating. Uh, you can get all of our contacts and sign up on, for our email list um, by using the QR code, or you can visit these sites. So we do hope we'll see you at some future events. Okay, but today we have two events. And the first of it, which is about to start, um, uh, as soon as I introduce uh, our uh, speaker today. So I'm really, really delighted to be able to uh, reintroduce, because you've given a talk uh, for us before, but to reintroduce Dr. Mohammed Abdu, who is a um, former PhD student, graduated here from cultural studies uh, at Queens, uh, and has gone on to be an assistant professor in sociology at the American University in Cairo, and is currently a postdoctoral fellow in global racial justice uh, at the Ainaudi Center for Global Affairs at Cornell University. Um, and he is the author of a fascinating um, and provocative and thoughtful and stimulating book called Islam and Anarchism, Relationships and Resonances. He's going to be talking about one part of that book in today's talk called Anarcha Islam Towards an Anti and Non-Authoritarian Islam. But I encourage you also to get the book and also come this evening to the book launch. We'll have a little conversation about the book as a whole uh, and you can ask even more questions and also buy the book. Um, novel Idea will be having a table and the author I think will be glad to sign copies. Uh, so uh, do come out, that's this evening, seven to nine p.m. and it's in Mac Corey B201. Okay, so without any further ado, please join me in welcoming Dr. Mohammed Abdu. Thank you. Might be a little bit strange putting this on, so do you mind if I nod and just oh, yeah. try try the volume? Can you all hear me okay? So, Assalamu alaikum, everyone. It's an honor and a pleasure to be here amongst you all. On Hod Nishoni and Anishinaabe territory. Let me start off by saying uh, a few remarks, inshallah. 
Uh, generally speaking, and as Adnan noted, this will be more of a lecture style presentation um, than the evening talk. Uh, when, well, frankly speaking, I'll let loose uh, a little bit more, maybe more than a little bit more. Um, so today's talk is obviously on Islam and anarchism, but particularly an excerpt or particular element of discussion. Ah, oh, okay. So you would like me to speak yes, it on. Okay. Better? Yeah. All right. So uh, today's talk uh, is certainly going to be more, uh, let's put it this way, more direct, more straightforward, insofar as a particular theme uh, and a particular chapter uh, within the book itself. That said, I'm not going to uh, avoid rhetoric entirely. Um, I work at Cornell University the largest land grab university on Turtle Island. Close to a million acres, specifically 990,000 acres, stolen from indigenous people, 250 tribes or nations that were displaced. Cornell's territory stretches all the way from obviously New York to Wisconsin, all the way to California. That's gonna figure very importantly insofar as Islam and anarchism and particularly an anti-authoritarian Islam. But to start off, we need to all make sure um, that we're on the same page insofar as the terms that I'm going to be using um, so that, inshallah, it's more accessible, it's more understood. The first image that I'd like to show obviously derives from Dr. Eve Tuck's work. I taught for Dr. Eve Tuck, her graduate course on indigenous land education and black geographies at UFT quite a few years ago. And it was a great honor given the fact that I'm not indigenous and I'm certainly not black. Now, settler colonialism. That's the US, that's Canada, that's Australia, that's New Zealand, uh, that's Israel, generally relies on this schema. The full-on genocide of indigenous people and an ongoing genocide, it's not a genocide that ended, the genocide is very much ongoing. As the children of our kin are being unearthed from our marked graves and the land continues to be stolen. But the idea becomes the theft of land, that's where indigenous people quote unquote, figure in to settler colonialism. It's a conquistador settler colonialism, as Tiffany Lithabo King versed to it. Why? Because there's a crusading element, what Adnan says or refers to as a crusading society. Manifest destiny, doctrines of discovery, terra nullius, these were Christian crusading doctrines. This is not the secular society. The constitution, be it in the US, Canada, is based on a Protestant ethic, certain understandings of property, and so on and so forth. So it is a religious project. It is an ongoing war on certainly an extension of the Crusades and a war particularly on Islam that will become relevant in a moment. The other element of settler colonialism is the so-called slave. Because once I've cleared the land of its original inhabitants, supposedly, and stolen the land, then I need to engage in the indentured servitude of black people. And by the way, a third to a fifth of the transatlantic slaves were Muslims from the Iberian Peninsula and the west coast of Africa. So there you go, you begin to see intersections. And in 1492, as Columbus was discovering the Americas, something else was going on across the oceans, across the Atlantic. And that was Muslims and Jews being evicted, persecuted, forced conversions, and murdered. The hands of the sword. And the same logic, the Enlightenment project, and rationale that we used to condemn them was used against indigenous and black people because Muslims and Jews were regarded as savages, as heathens, as godless, and so on and so forth. The second image, just so that we're very clear, what I don't fear is the white supremacy that Trump brings about. What I fear is the white supremacy that liberalism brings about. Hillary Clinton and Obama certainly scare me a lot more than the KKK. And it's for this reason. This is covert white supremacy. This is liberalism. This is the stuff that is neo-Nazis and certain assumptions and so on and so forth. So what I fear more is liberalism and even progressivism because it leaves an imprint on, uh, or it has been imprinted vis-a-vis -vis liberalism. In order to deal with 1492, again, we need to understand that there's an ongoing settler colonial project. This project results in external and internal colonialism, 
simultaneously, displacement, migration, wars, of course, racial capitalism, and so on and so forth, that are enacted upon so-called post-colonial nations that never really underwent the project of decolonization, besides a few land reforms here and there, and that causes the displacement of migrants, be queer Muslims, be it whoever it may be, such that they become migrants within the settler colonial order, migrate here and become active good Muslim subjects, participating ostensibly in the ongoing theft of indigenous land, of indigenous uh, genocide, and certainly anti-blackness. And there's a great deal of anti-blackness within, unfortunately, our Swana communities, let alone Arab supremacy, let alone Sunni supremacy, all which I discuss in the book. And anti-non-authoritarian Islam. What is the premise for that? Well, in my own work, and particularly insofar as the book, I use the Quran because regardless of whether you're from the nation of Islam or from whatever other Muslim sects, and there are over 73, ultimately the Quran becomes the source code. Muslims may disagree over the Sunnah insofar as the prophetic oral practice. They may even disagree over the Hadith because of Ilm al-Hadith and the science that is pertained insofar as the genealogy and so far as the chain of transmission when we are narrating sayings that the Prophet engaged in. Right? So I primarily refer to the Quran. That becomes my foundation, not that I don't refer to the Sunnah or the oral tradition for that matter, or the prophetic practice. The first element in so far as the Quran is concerned and where we can begin to discern an anti-authoritarian Islam. And here I'd like to distinguish between anti and non, because saying that I'm anti something, I'm anti-capitalist, that's a rhetorical, polemical position. Actually going back and decolonizing materially land-based concepts and practices that exist within Islam, within my own tradition, and beginning to extract these practices, this is where I refer to as non-authoritarianism or non-capitalism. The first is shura. Of course, we have the chapter of shura, the chapter of mutual consultation, within Islam. That's a non-authoritarian and an anti-authoritarian concept and practice within Islam. We can find other concepts like maslaha, which is public welfare, ijma', community consensus, khulafa in the plural. And I'll get to this prerogative of the caliphate in a bit, because no such governing order per se exists. Khulafa is used in the plural form within the Quran, and one can find it in several verses, some of which are noted 769, 774, 2762, and so on and so forth. To most Muslims and non-Muslim scholars, the caliphate, or what is referred to as the caliphate, is supposed to be, is a governing order that emerged following the golden era, particularly in Islam, whereby the logic was that the ummah was to be led by a certain khalifa, a singular khalifa which is often perceived or misinterpreted as political successor. Despite the fact that the concept, like I said, of caliphate is not a fundamental part of Islam. Sovereignty lies in the ummah in Islam and not the caliphate because Islam and God did not ever determine a macro political structure by which Muslims organize themselves. They had to internalize certain micro, and I say this purposely, micro-fascistic or anti-authoritarian concepts and practices that they embodied in their day-to-day -day lives. Fascism is a mass psychology. Why do I say that? Because there's a difference between one saying Trump is a fascist and that the system itself is fascist. Hannah Arendt wrote The Origins of Totalitarianism, and totalitarianism is where the state in a vertical, which is organized vertically, hierarchically, uses all its mechanisms, the police, the military, neoliberal academy at its service and at its disposal as the Bush administration used it during the Iraq war, the academy was part of that narrative, in order to make the justification for totalitarian militarized intervention in all kinds of societies, particularly in Iraq and Afghanistan. Why do I say fascism is a mass psychology? Because Hannah Arendt wrote, uh, or sorry, it was William Reich that wrote the mass or the political psychology or the mass psychology of fascism. Why do I refer to it as a mass psychology? Our real fathers are the nation state and capitalism. Every nation state is racist. That's Foucault. Capitalism inherently is also racial, as Cedric Robinson had taught, as Ruthie Gilmore Wilson, Maryam Kaba, and so on. Daddy is the state. 
Daddy teaches us how to discipline, to control, to categorize, to hierarchize people, to judge based on surface, and then to embody those within our own dynamics and relationships with one another, insofar as the streets. Okay. Capitalism, nothing is sacred to it. Che Guevara on a t-shirt, a symbol of anti-capitalist resistance on a t-shirt. Love is celebrated on Valentine's Day or in pride marches, which is surrounded by Heineken, advertisements, and so on and so forth. That's pride. Or that's supposedly what pride is supposed to signify. So we are Oedipal subjects. With this father and this mother, we learn to commoditize, materialize our relationships. Everything is up for grabs in that sense. These are our parents, and we've internalized all these micro-fascistic tendencies. You see, the state is not something that hovers over and above us. We all govern one another already vis-a-vis -a, -vis a set of capillary networks or relationships insofar as the asymmetrical power dynamics that exist between us because of the different positionalities that we hold. So I have a certain male privilege in comparison to a Muslim woman and so on and so forth. And if blackness figures into the equation, then certainly that. So. Then there is Ijma'a, community consensus, of course, sorry. I talked, of course, with regards to those three, and then the concept of khulafa. I've mentioned a bunch of verses in which God uses khulafa in the plural. We are all caretakers of the land. We are all responsible in our symbiotic relationship to other than human life, and we are accountable for that on the day of power, or resurrection. There is the concept of tawheed, which implicitly and explicitly means the identification of anybody but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, at least for Muslims, be it a nation state, which we pledge allegiance to in order to attain citizenship, that we come about and we swear that we would defend Canada, even if it is by means of taking up arms. That is the extent. Now our God has been replaced by the so-called secular Christianized state. Now tell me, does this not break tawheed? Particularly insofar as our migrations as people of color, as ostensibly Muslims, onto this land. Where is the responsibility insofar as the hijra, i.e. our migration? So Tawheed becomes a very important concept. You don't deify your children, you don't deify a flag, you don't worship anything, and you don't pledge allegiance to anything. Here you have to pledge allegiance to the queen in order to achieve citizenship. And supposedly Muslims are okay with that. Imam is a concept which refers to as a spirit, quote unquote, spiritual successor. But something that we need to understand with regards to Imam is that there isn't necessarily a dictum within Islam that says that there needs to be one human leader because if we're all khulafa, then we're all participating in caretaking. If one were to think about the original polity of the Prophet Muhammad والسلام, and all the companions of the Prophet, women, men, etc., they all had embodied in a revolutionary way, shura maslahi jama'ah. You see, engaging in a revolution, as the Quran exactly says, in Allah la yughayr ma biqawmin hatta yughayr ma bi anfusihim. And I live Tahrir Square. Right. So this fantasy that social change has to deal with something external to us is an illusion. We are the vehicles for that social change, and that's why Tahrir ended up falling apart the way that it has. We've yet to see whether that can be resurrected in any way, shape, or form, but it certainly won't happen in the same way that it occurred. The state usually relies on a politics of rights. The lowest common denominator that is necessary for an individual or a party to get elected. What I'm talking about is a different kind of mu'amalat, a politics of responsibility that a community would exercise insofar as its relationship within the community itself. So a politics of responsibility. You don't have rights until you know what your responsibility is, be it to indigenous people, be it to your kin, be it to whoever. Most scholars on Muslim governance always affirm that human leaders must be subordinate in one way to another to the supreme textual imams. Because in the death of the Prophet a real imam is the Quran. It is the guide, because that is literally what the imam is. It acts as a guide. And power is always fluid. So why the need to concentrate it in a hierarchical, crystallized form within the nation state that is only going to expand of the asymmetries of power amongst the populace? 
So part of the argument here is that there is no need for a human imam per se. The Quran acts as our imam. And then we engage in debates because there is an usul to ikhtilaf and ethics of disagreements that Muslims are commanded to abide by insofar as achieving consensus, insofar as their decision making and seeing what is best for the public welfare. You know, I shudder to think that Muslims don't even understand the meaning of their own tradition. For instance, how many Muslims would translate Islam, and this is very common, into the word submission in English? Well, that is a wrong translation because the word for submission in English is actually khudu'a, completely different word. Islam comes from the root sallama, to willfully deliver based on thought, critical thought, action, and by choice. Yet Muslims continue to interpret it in an orientalist fashion as submission. And what does submission suggest? It suggests benevolent, act of simple belief, without thinking, without reflection, without anything whatsoever. And this is why it's very Orientalist, because it takes the agency from Muslims to actually think through their traditions. They're not simply Muslim by being born so, although that may be true, but rather by engaging in critical thought. The Quran constantly says, Do they not think? Do they not reflect? And by far, it is not a literalist text because 60 to 70 percent of the Quran is calling on folks, its parables, its metaphors, it's calling on folks to engage with one another, to learn from one another. And we've created you from different tribes and nations so that you may get to know one another, get to know one another, not dominate one another. And the best amongst you are those who exercise what? Taqwa. Piety, but piety in relationship to what? Adal ijtima'iyya, social justice. So the, I want to also address the role of the Prophet ﷺ. Prophet Muhammad is nothing but a messenger and a nabi, a rasul and a prophet, for a spiritual call born purely for the sake of conveying Islam's message, da'wah to the world. There are three verses that solidify this. Say, O Muhammad, that I am only a mortal like you. The second verse, 41.6. Say, I, Muhammad, am nothing but a mortal. It is revealed to me by inspiration that your Allah is one Allah. The third verse directly addresses the scope of the Prophet's authority. For those who take as awliya, means guardians, supporters, helpers, protectors, others besides Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, as protectors and worship them, even then Allah is a protector over them. So it is not Muhammad's decision in the first place as to whom is to be protected and whom to is not to be protected. If you were worshiping Muhammad at the death of the Prophet Muhammad, Muhammad himself said, if you are worshiping Muhammad, Muhammad has died. But if you are worshiping God, Allah hayun layam. God is alive and God does not die and does not perish. He's not begotten and he does not beget or they, because again, Allah is ungendered. Of course, we have Allah. Allah says in the Quran, if God wanted to create us as a single community, God would have been capable to do so. But again, the whole purpose is that we may mitigate our differences and get to know one another and vie for social justice. There's no compulsion in religion. La ikraha fi deen, what would be the point? And that's crucial within the Quran itself. We come to another term, dawla. If you ask any Muslim or any Arabic speaker, what is the word for state? The immediate response will be dawla. Dawla does not mean state. We did not have a word for state because the state is a Euro-colonial governing order that was developed vis-a-vis Euro-America. So even Daesh or ISIS, when they come about and say, they have a little understanding of the fact that there is no such thing as an Islamic state. And Wa'il Halaq, who I draw upon, certainly wrote a book titled The Impossible State. I'll get to Dawla uh, in a moment, because what I would also like to say about Dawla is these set of facts, if you will. Yeah. 
Yeah, yeah, I did it because I just wanted to uh, uh, read off some of my notes that are not on the slides. So, Dawla actually stems, since we started this discussion, Dawla actually stems from the verb Dal, which morphically as well as semantically falls between two verbs, Dar, to rotate, and Zal, which means to go away. So it's meant to symbolize something that is very dynamic, not something with a static border the same way that nation states have borders that were created vis-a-vis -vis imperialism and colonialism. So there is a this dehistoricized view insofar as the Islamic State. Arab nationalists use the dawla as a post-colonial term to refer to each individual Arab state that exists. You have Egypt, you have Syria, you have Morocco, and so on and so forth. Dawla has been dis uh, deployed by movements such as ISIS, as Daesh, as I said, insofar as a dawla al-Islami. Dawla, though, revolves mainly around the notions of temporality, change, rotation, as opposed to a fixed order which defines the elements of the nation states, as I noted. So temporality and succession are certainly central to the meaning of dawla. Chapter 59 in the Quran, Surah Al-Hashr, verse 7, for example, speaks of the Prophet's distribution of the spoils of war, so that it creates dawlatun baynakum, so that, again, the money is not hoarded in one hand, but rather it, it is shared amongst the community within itself. We also see it in another verse within the Quran, insofar as Surah Ali Imran, when God is referring to the transformation of human vestitudes, insofar as one day we have our health, and then the next day our health wanes and fails. So that is the circulation. That is what dawla actually means. In Islam, actually, pre-modern history, there are multiplicity of dawlas sometimes within one dawla loosely resembling a decentralized confederacy. So now we begin to see, in addition to the other concepts and practices that I evoked, ostensibly the horizon of an anarchistic something that is going on. Dawla, by definition, obviously cannot formulate an ummah, which is where sovereignty lies. As I said, sometimes, and historically speaking, you have the Hamdanite, you have the Buayyid, the Ikshidi, the Ayyubi, and Mamuli dawlas that informed the Abbas. Abyssinian period and the Ummah at the time, Muhammad Ali Kibir's Dawlas were within the Uthmani period and informed the Ummah. The fact that you had an Umayyad Khalifite did not mean necessarily that you had a Syria. And the fact that you had Abbasid and uh, a Khalifite did not mean necessarily that you had an Iraq either. So, the Ummah becomes the logic and the Umm insofar as sovereignty, whereby we are seeking to establish and the Ummah is not connected per se to a particular boundary or particular territory. It's ever expanding and in relationship to others that it is encountering in other territories while respecting, again, the relationships between Islam and the territories in which ostensibly Islam or Muslims might be encroaching or migrating or moving to. It is a dynamic world. So, the Ummah etymologically, and from an Islamic and arguably even Islamist perspective, because what is the term Islamist? Again, that's another Orientalist term that suggests the politicization of Islam as opposed to the fact that any idea is inherently political. Judaism is inherently political. Any idea is inherently political, period. However, Ummah is designated in Lisan al-Arab, one of the foremost sort of authoritative Arabic doctrines, or dictionaries, sorry, written by uh, Al-Ansari, as emanating from the root M, which literally is a verb that means to head, for, to quest, to lead, to guide. As a noun, it also means destination, purpose, pursuit, aim, goal, and so on. So the Ummah could even be one person. Prophet Abraham والسلام, was described as an Ummah unto himself. Surely Ibrahim was an Ummah obedient unto God, a man of pure faith and not an idolater. So again, we begin to see a different orientation cosmologically, politically, ethically, and so on, insofar as ostensibly what can constitute a non-authoritarian or anti-authoritarian Islam. Unfortunately, 
post-colonialism that assumed by simply taking over our nation states, that that would offer some grand schema of decolonization, began to conjure up or Arabize particular Muslim concepts. So I recited earlier the verse, insofar as And so in Islam, there are particular categories. For instance, Qawm, which is a people. Sha'ab, smaller nation. And then Qabail, smaller tribes. And the idea is to use these quantitative qualifiers in order to preserve a degree of responsibility between larger nations and smaller tribes or smaller communities. Nonetheless, the word Qawm was taken to inform a kind of pan-Arabism, al-Qawmiyya al-Arabiyya, or al-Qawmiyya al-Afriqiyya, the African uh, um, Qawm or peoplehood. And Wataniya, insofar as each individual nation being a nation onto its own. So al wataniya al masriya would be Egyptian nationalism. But there was a limitation to that logic because there's a difference between post-colonialism and even anti-colonialism and decolonization. As Yves Tuck, again, very much straightforwardly puts out, you celebrate the return of your resources. That's one thing, knowing what to do with these resources and how to go back to your own traditions to develop your own governance models, your own models of economic exchange, of egalitarianism, of gender relations, and so on, is something altogether different. Decolonization is an inherently violent act that way. And we live in violence consistently and constantly. Violence at the level of the street, the sexism, the racism, the everything, all the isms that we experience every single day. But also the violence insofar as identity, insofar as learning how to redream dangerously, because we have a poverty of imagination, our BIPOC people. We can, again, we continue to harp or strive to use particularly the state, which we assume to be a neutral entity in order to institute social change, as opposed to understanding the fact that the state only serves to contribute, again, to the crystallization of certain power dynamics. It's easier to take over, in a Marxist-Leninist way, institutions and think that you're going to change the state in that way. It's easier. But what's more difficult is actually building community at a horizontal level in which there is actually face-to-face -face interactions because you're not forced to do that when your relationships are being mitigated vis-a-vis -vis a third party, which is the nation state. But we've accepted the nation state as the de facto colonial model. We refuse to go back to our native ways of governance or actually begin to think outside the box. And if colonialism has stripped anything, it is our ability to imagine, to dream dangerously again. This is the degree of shame over inferiority complex in a Pannonian way that particularly Muslims have internalized. We want the technology of the West. We want the so many advances of the West, but we don't want to deal with gender. We don't want to deal with queerness, despite the fact that we have medieval Arabic literature, sex manuals, art that deals with same-sex desire, etc., etc. But we won't, and we don't want to confront that legacy. We tend to sterilize our own history. In the book, of course, I refer to a lot of medieval uh, Muslim scholars, uh, um, uh, Al Mawardi, Muhammad Al Ghazali, of course, we have Ibn Al Aqil, Ibn Al Taymiyyah, Ibn Al Qayyim, Ibn Al Najim, and many other more, in addition to contemporaries. So, given this poverty of imagina or imagination, and the fact that we feel so much shame as people of color that we straighten our hair, we like to dress like white people. We've internalized cultures of whiteness, which is even more dangerous, because cultures of whiteness means that we've adopted the civilizational, freedom, democratic values of the West that we regard as superior than our own traditions, than our own cultures, than our own spiritualities have to offer. This is the degree of shame that we would bow down and mourn a queen that was responsible for everything from colonialism and imperialism to opium wars. That is the degree of indignity that we have, the lack of confidence that we have insofar as our own ways. So who exactly are we worshiping? Are we worshiping this queen or are we worshiping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Who are we pledging allegiance to? To the queen, to a Canadian nation state that continues to engage in the thieving and the genocide of indigenous people? 
Is that the price that we're willing to pay in our hijra, in our migration? Maybe we do have a lot of things to learn insofar as actually the Prophet Muhammad's message, as a matter of fact. So as I said earlier, sovereignty insofar as pre-colonial Muslim usage lied in the ummah, the ummah that was supposed to include Muslims, non-Muslims, vis-a-vis the Medina Charter or Mithaq in Medina that the Prophet Muhammad, in the original formation of the polity, had. Muslims, Jews, Christians, Sabians, people from all kinds of denominations, because guess what? Quran is a message not just for Muslims. It's a message for al-mu'min, believers. God does not shy if one actually reads the Quran and reads it well and tries to understand and grasp it well. There are several categories of reference within the Quran. Number one, the Quran distinguishes between the word religion, which is an anthropological category, certainly you are American, the closest approximation in Arabic to which it is deen. And that is different from iman, faith, and that is different, but it also interconnected to ruhaniya, spirituality. Three interrelated categories that, yes, speak to one another, but are not necessarily the same. God does not shy in verses in the Quran to say, Ya yuha al muslimin wal muslimat. When God wants to speak to Muslims, God speaks to Muslims directly. But in so many verses, God says, Ya ayyuha al mu'minin wal mu'minat, or believers. So, what exactly ontologically, epistemologically defines a believer from the so called kafir or the infidel? Well, the infidel is the one, or the kafir is the one that corrupts in the earth, doesn't mind the welfare of the orphan, of the poor, of the elderly, of women, who engages in israf. So we begin to see the relevance of mu'mineen. Mu'mineen don't necessarily have to be Muslims, and they don't necessarily have to be, per se, people of the book. But they are believers, and they are believers in higher value, and a value that stands for social justice. And that becomes or should become the ontological epistemological categorization that causes us Muslims to sit down and reflect upon our responsibilities to so-called non-Muslims, because guess what? There are Muslims that are Zionists. There are Jews that are Zionists. There are all kinds. We have salads within our own communities. It is not a matter of simply praying five times a day, because at the end of the day, if that prayer does not lead you to act in a humble way insofar as women, insofar as the elderly, insofar as the land on which you reap the fruits and labor from, then what kind of a Muslim are you? When the Prophet came, the Prophet came to institute adal ijtima'iyya. Because guess what? The original message was that hijab, no hijab, Ramadan, fasting, that wasn't it. For 10 years, the Prophet Muhammad sat down with one message, one line actually. La ilaha illallah Muhammadun Rasulullah. This is Aqidah Tawheed. There's only one creator, and Muhammad is the final messenger in that line. Why? Because if any prophet or any messenger, including Jesus or Moses or any of the other prophets, insofar as the monotheistic traditions, if we just hold on to that for a moment, came and said, you need to do this, and you need to do that, and this is halal or haram, who would believe? Who would want to follow? And this is the problem with regards to Daesh, with regards to ISIS. They harped on a dream of an ummah. They understood, and we all saw it, that dividing line between Iraq and Syria, it's an arbitrary border. We all dream, insofar as Muslims are now arraigned, on the image of the ummah. And they played on that image. The problem with ISIS is that ethical, political commitments that informed their ummah was very totalitarian. They didn't want to institute adal al-ijtima'iyya. For that to be a premise, by what right am I going to go or expect in Saudi Arabia or otherwise, to apply hudud laws that I would sever somebody's hand for stealing when I have not provided the environment or the condition by which people would have a good quality of life in the first place, such that they wouldn't need to steal a banana in order to feed their own families. So, as I noted earlier, dawla does not mean state. Um, and I went a little bit insofar as that discussion. And this is part of the beauty of the Quran. There's not and no creature moving on earth, not a bird flying on its two wings, but they are all communities, qaba'il and shu'ub. We have not missed anything in the book. The consequence of Arab and Muslim adoption of capitalist nation states, as Tamim al-Barghuti writes, is that there are two competing sets of loyalties now. 
It led to the colonial redefinition of Arabs and Muslims in two mutually exclusive images to serve. The original nation state, I am born in Egypt, therefore I have to pledge my wala, my allegiance to Egypt, I have to worship its flag, I have to go fight in its name if need be. No different than America that conscripts black indigenous people of color to go engage in imperialist adventurism and go kill black and brown people elsewhere. Well, tell me if black lives still matter, and certainly there are still George Floyd's and Sandra Bland's, Michael Brown's, still going on. If black lives matter, should AFRICOM and Africa matter? Africa that is the size of East and West Europe, let alone Russia, let alone Japan, that is the size of Africa. It is huge. Where is that in our calculus from an abolitionist perspective? Particularly if we're being critical of the nation state and what authoritarianism is. This is at least an approximate map of Turtle Island. And if one pulled similar images of pre-modern Muslim history, one would certainly see contours as such. You did not have the styrated, linearized spaces that exist in modernity. I actually have, and it was a wonderful image, I believe, by a historian is actually at Columbia University that shows somewhat the transformation of Muslim societies, particularly over three to four centuries of time. Now, of course, I'm not going to encapsulate 1,443 years of Muslim history. And I'm not interested in romanticizing that history either, because Muslims certainly created and were responsible for our own demise, let alone atrocities of our own. But that is the degree of nepotism and despotism and our own egoism that fed into the process. But then we need to go back and begin to extract, like I said, and this is my hope, this is my wish, is to extract the ethical and political commitments that should have informed this identity Muslim. Identities are very limited in that way. They're tactically important because guess what? Yeah. Black people and indigenous people and people of color suffer the consequences of racism every single day. So there's a reality to that, but also strategically limited because who's black and who's indigenous? Well, you have black people that were responsible for indigenous extermination and you have indigenous people that were responsible for black enslavement. This is colonialism and this is how it pits us against one another. We have black Cherokees, we have black Mi'kmaq and so on and so forth. So Afro indigenous spirituality, these are very much entwined. You can't liberate black people and you can't have an abolitionist project without, again, engaging with the fact that this is stolen land. The prison you're about to remove or want to remove is on stolen land. So you need to also contend with that. We need a 1492 project and not a 1619 project. And it needs to be anti-authoritarian because we have to understand how power functions. It is asymmetrical. It is fluid. And so we have to contend with the process of accountability, responsibility, and actually investing in getting to know one another so that we can build a more pluriverse world. If not for ourselves, then as a Mumi Abu Jamal, for our children that come from immortality and are the arrows that we shoot towards infinity. So more dignity as people of color, more dignity as Muslims. The settler state functions upon the logic of assimilation. Everybody has to be a hyphenated anything. Muslim American, and supposedly unapologetic, despite the contradictions that I pointed to, Asian American, African American. The only American that doesn't have to justify their own sense of identity or label it insofar as the racialization is the white American that is assumed to be native. But this is where I find, and this is where I say, it's not a matter of skin color as much as, yeah, we bleach our skin white in certain societies because of the degree of self-hate that we've internalized. It's a matter of cultures of whiteness that even black, indigenous, and people of color communities have bought into. And historically, it is impossible to separate capitalism from the nation state. Though they may have short-term animosities, their long-term strategic interests are very much the same. 
Capitalism would not have emerged without the nation state and vice versa. And both are racial projects. So the contours of an anarchistic Islam, therefore, are there. The concepts are there, but they need to be put into practice. Again, when the Prophet came about, when one looks at, for instance, the so-called second khalf, Umar. Umar who hated Muhammad. Umar who wanted to murder Muhammad before he became a Muslim. Umar who used to bury his own daughter because of Arab femicide within society. There's a difference between revolutions and the way that they happened historically and people's revolutionary becomings. Revolutions mean, be it in the context of religion or otherwise, you transform of yourself the way that you eat, the way that you sleep, the way that you engage in intimacy, the way that you conceive of the world. And if you're not willing to do that, then what would be the point of the verse in Allah la yaghir ma bakum and hatta yaghir ma ba'anfusim? God does not change up people until they change themselves. You're pointing at Mubarak and you're saying, down with the regicide. Yeah, but there's a mini Mubarak, a mini Trump, a mini Obama that exists inside any, and each one of us waiting to be unleashed. Because of what I noted of the fact that we are weaned by family members that consist of the nation state and capitalism. These are real edible parents. I'll conclude there for now and uh, perhaps receive a few questions, comments, or whatever it is that you wish to share. Thank you. Sorry, I didn't. Are there? Yes, please. It's, if I'm not mistaken, it's the second time I see you at Queens. Many years ago, you came from Montreal, right? So it's good to see you again. Good to see you as well. And I just have a question. You were talking about these Muslim nation states. Mm -hmm. Is that has been caused by, you, you refer to it to be a kind of a production of the colonialism, and it is a post-colonial, and of course, timeline, um, certainly there is no argument that the map of the Muslim lands that we have uh, is certainly a map drawn after World War II, even much later than the coming of the colonials, and uh, what I am wondering, even before coming of the colonial powers to Muslim societies in 14 and 15 and 16 centuries, which Professor Atman knows better than me, <laughs> uh, even the last three great Muslim empires mm -hmm. of the Ottomans, of the Safavids, and of the Mughals in India, they were a kind of nation state by themselves. And even under the overall umbrella of so much idealized and romanticized of the age of, uh, you know, the greater caliphate before the coming of the Mongols and so, these lines were drawn according to ethnic and linguistic, let alone sometimes religious uh, affiliations. Uh, so I am wondering, is it always good or complete to talk about the hands of the colonials in everything that Muslims are suffering or they are experiencing, particularly reference to nation states that you said, mm. why such a thing existed before, even under the Caliphate in Baghdad, there were different sultans and kingdoms ruling uh, different parts of the Islamic land. So I'm wondering, of course, those students here or somewhere else who know me, I am always teaching these kinds of things mm -hmm. myself. But this is a question, because you address us Muslims and inferiority complex mm -hmm. things. I'm wondering to what extent this is true. So this is something 
Uh, I mean, to what extent we can emphasize it? It is true, but to what extent we should focus on the Andes, the role of the colonials? The second the comment or question or something, just for a matter of conversation, sure. referring to this uh, inferiority complex uh, that you refer to the way that we uh, dress up, the way that we uh, eat, the way of that we live. Mm -hmm. So, first of all, it applies to each and every individual that was you are here, including yourself, including mm -hmm. myself. And the second thing is that in the past also, this diverse culture and ethnic uh, Muslim lands, mm -hmm. as you said, they were giving and taking from it, uh, each other. They were imitating each other. And this is a new time. I mean, we did not choose how, what is the solution for that. Muslims are living in a time and age that have, they have inherited this tradition, right? And this is the reality of the global time and age. So I don't understand what is the solution other than referring to us having the inferiority complex. I think sometimes we also, in too much criticism, we are self beating mm. We are beating ourselves perhaps too hard without thinking of what grand scale solution can be given to our, for instance, the way of clothing and dressing up and eating and using technology mm -hmm. if we don't want to have inferiority complex so far. Thank you. <laughs> um, so let me, let me uh, try and address both. So I might be speaking to both simultaneously insofar yes. as your comments. Um, uh, maybe because you arrived a little bit late, I certainly blame Muslims for the condition in which we're at. And I certainly don't seek to either engage in a reductionist reading of 1,443 years of Muslim history, too extensive to be convinced, nor to romanticize it. And I was very clear with regards to that. I'm not interested in romanticizing because absolutely Muslims have committed much atrocities and oppressions in the name of Islam. So I'm certainly going to center colonial modernity and particularly taking 1492 and the successive imprints insofar as the Crusades and with each confrontation, ostensibly the impact that it had on Muslims. But what I'm saying is that from the moment that the Prophet died, in fact, we started to sway away from the message, from the principles, from the economic, governing, and political trajectories that the Quran particularly was trying to emphasize. Shura, ijma, maslaha, the focus on the ummah. There is no such thing, and I insist on that, on the nation state. Because the nation state is very different, even with regards to the three caliphate models, ostensibly 16th, 17th, 18th century. We have to again understand what the nation state is and its relationship to racial capitalism. You certainly then have politics of passports, migration, borders, yes, are, controls. Me, I am yeah. aware that these are all modern notions and creations, even in the West. These are not uh, just only for the. So I have totally agree with you that these are all modern, and uh, even in the, in the Western context, they did not have such a thing as a nation state and pushing of the entire population to the center and then participating in politics. This is totally modern. Yeah. So the other point is that, of course, I'm not exempt from participating in the markets, from participating in forces insofar as the settler state, because again, I started from that concept, from that context, insofar as, as a migrant, as a person of color, as a settler Muslim who engaged in hijra, I'm still a settler. And it's very hypocritical when we, you're asking for solutions. Well, maybe a solution would be the fact that I would acknowledge the fact that I'm a settler on stolen land. That when I go and engage in direct action and I say out on the streets, free, free Palestine, and I don't do anything in relationship to indigenous struggles, then I am the biggest hypocrite of a Muslim that there is, because I'm a Zionist on stolen land. That becomes the political positioning. But I'm saying it's not only with regards to anti-blackness, because we have enough Arab supremacy and Sunni supremacy, let alone anti-blackness within Swana communities. We also had black Muslim empires, and we need to therefore distinguish also between slavery, medieval slavery, and modern contemporary slavery, let alone, and again, I'm not condoning, but there is a difference insofar as 
transatlantic slavery, from other forms of slavery that also existed, historically speaking, and which many participated in, Muslims, Jews, Christians, and so on and so forth, and many communities, in fact. Blacks against blacks, and so on and so forth. So the positioning element becomes very important. I now pledge my allegiance to the settler state. I now go and get my groceries from Metro. What is my responsibility insofar as the land, the other than non-human life, let alone the land that continues to be stolen? We begin from there, and we build outwards. Let me project even further. We're seeing what is going on in Iran. Happen right now, yes. right? Now, I'm all supportive insofar as women choosing how and when, etc., cetera, insofar as their dress, and so on and so forth. But what I fear is another situation like Tahrir. We have to ask ourselves in this particular moment, and this is not taking away from Mahsa Amin, this is actually contextualizing from a geopolitical framework what is going on in the moment. There's a nuclear deal that's being negotiated that really won't happen. There's an asymmetric war that is going on insofar as Israel, insofar as Zionism, and so on. So there is a real politique that needs to be injected on the same day that Mahsa was murdered or killed. We had a 15-year-old Iraqi girl that was sniped by a US soldier. The optics of what gets attention and what not, we have thousands of people protesting the Haitian government that is supported by the US. A so, years in Hazaras in Afghanistan last week. A third of Pakistan underneath water. So there isn't an Islamic world. We are separate, we are been divided, conquered. It is that Machiavellian and Manishian order. In order to see through that ummah that I spoke to vis-a-vis -vis the Medina Charter, we need to understand then our responsibilities to one another. The Muslim towards the indigenous, towards the black, and so on and so forth. And not, and while being mindful that these categories are not separable from one another, as easy as BIPOC or LGBTIQT, etc., that have certain assumptions, not only insofar as, again, the categorization, you can either black or indigenous or a person of color, as if there aren't black Arabs, black South Asians, and so on. So it is beginning to develop a different paradigm a different way of living that is pluriverse, but in relationship to land and the situated land on which I am on. And beginning to push the ambulum from a decolonial perspective, a material perspective, that way. But I have to do it from my own also perspective, because decolonization means, okay, indigenous people are calling for sovereignty, are calling for their own traditional means of governance. Not all of them, because they have their sellouts too, but generally an anti-status trajectory. Let me go back to my Islam. Is there a premise? for an anarchistic Islam that way? And what is the governing order that exists within and across Muslim history, let alone from a conceptual perspective vis-a-vis -vis the Quran? And the way that Muslims understood the Quran, whether they, whether they applied it or didn't apply it and misconstrued. This is why the Khalifite model I find to be very problematic, because that's not a governing order. It just happened to emerge progressively with the Prophet's death. The Prophet did not refer to himself as Khalifat al-Muslimin, he didn't. He engaged in shura, ijma'a, maslaha with the community. Aisha went to meet Ali at the battlefield and so on and so forth. So we see the opportunity for the challenging of even opportunities in which despotic rulers would come into play. That is much harder to do now because of control and disciplinary societies from a, from a Foucauldian perspective that we're speaking of. At least back then, if one came up with a political theological argumentation that would go against this despotic ruler, or this dictator, or that dictator, there is an opportunity to challenge, because the opportunity to provide a political theological arguments in which the masses would be mobilized, or would be convinced by, to follow through, existed. And we see many incidences historically of Muslim scholars putting up a fight against rulers that were despotic, Muawiyah and otherwise. So that becomes the question. Now we look at the state of Muslim scholars. They are either wards of the nation state or wards of academia. There's an article that I'm actually writing as to the extent to which Gulf money funds a lot of women gender studies programs, particularly in the context of the US. And I trace back the relationships between Gulf nations, particularly the Gulf nations, and universities like the University of Arizona. Because they saw the desert 
in the Arabian Peninsula is very similar to the so-called Terranolius land that existed in Arizona. Like in Israel, we found this land empty, and we are here to cultivate the civilization out of it. So the money flows, the material interests, the elite interests, the confluence of using religion as a vehicle to make the justifications for the Abraham Accords and so far as the Gulf countries normalizing with Israel. For instance, are are a part of that discourse because the state understands the role of religion very well. The problem is a lot of our leftist movements are animated by a secular orientation that doesn't want to deal with the element of religion. We don't want to deal with Malcolm and what Malcolm had to teach or what Martin had to teach or the political theological element of the conversation because of the assumption of there has to be secularism. But is there really a la cité that exists anywhere? Why would then bills be passed in Quebec, let alone in France, that are so keen on removing the hijab of women, if it's such a secular society? Why is there in God on a $1 bill, in God we trust on a $1 bill, so much for secularism? So, yeah, you're absolutely right. The blame goes all around, and we're responsible, because I also say this to Muslims. Look, indigenous people, as we all know, have had their lands continue to be stolen from them. Their children murdered, their language is stolen, Everything. What do we Muslims lack? We have our land, we have our resources, we have our Quran. What do we lack? And we're a billion something in numbers. We lack the will. We lack the will to engage in tajdeed and renewal as opposed to taqlid, emulation of the West. Thank so, you. yeah, you're welcome. Thank you, sir. All right. Um, okay, so I Our understandings of our words were changed too, so that we went from having a Tioshape, which would be like the Uma, and an Oyate, which you know did not rule, it simply was like the cultural similarities that brought like different Tioshape together. Um, anyway, in the chief and council system was implemented specifically to change our understanding of how we did that from a plural sense to a singular sense and then like help them suspect really essentially. So I thought that was interesting. And um, because when if we change how we understand words, then we would change like how we think we're supposed to interact and have like relation. Um, if I were to add a comment, I think it would be useful like back on slide three and then otherwise. Yeah. Um, that part of that, that, you know, the 60s and ongoing millennial scoop is relevant, especially because it like takes indigenous children still today at 70% um, and ensures that they will have that micro fascist upbringing that will also lead them to have a misunderstanding of how uh, their people related to the land mm -hmm. and to each other. Um, so yeah, and you know, so it is an ongoing thing, and it is also what keeps being taken from us. And I think it's important that people start including it more instead of waiting 20 years till it's over, like residential schools. The last was supposedly closed in 1995. In the, I just want to say something about the impact of that as a scoop survivor. Because, like, uh, scoop survivors, we make up the majority of indigenous folks in prison right now. And where that fascism succeeded, the majority of indigenous folks in academia, um, which has an impact if the majority of indigenous voices in academia were raised by white people. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm sorry that I had to be late and missed so much of this great talk, so I'll have to catch the recording. Um, but, so I'm sorry if the question that I'm going to ask is something that was already built in this in the talk. So, um, but I'm wondering, because you were saying how much of the original message 
contain important anti-capitalist you know, resources for us and how immediately there's a shift afterwards. I mean, I understand that point and I appreciate that point. I think that there's a lot of, you know, anti-patriarchal possibilities in reading the Quran that are really, really critical. Mm -hmm. At the same time, it seems to me that you also mentioned Muslim history, and I, but are you saying, like, how do you then incorporate practices, histories of accommodation, and ways of reinterpretation and you know rethinking of problems according to very specific examples? Do you think that those are not useful resources at all? So I was just trying to figure out mm -hmm. the relationship that you were trying to establish between possibilities of using history and using the original message. Mm -hmm. It seems like we're trying to privilege the first, but I'm wondering, like, can you use the resources of Islamic history Absolutely. as well? Absolutely. They are part of us. Can you create a dialogue with, with what to do? Because obviously not all of the resources are useful there. Mm -hmm. Thank you for your question, Martin. It's so good to see you. Um, History is certainly fundamental. What is Islam? It's not this amorphous idea. Islam is everything that pertains to Islam. Agriculture, astronomy, science, even culinary ways of eating, of living, the irrigation systems that Muslims had developed. Absolutely. Of course that has to deal with history. My concern with regards to this book was, simp was very fundamentally to show the Quranic practices to enable Muslims or to empower Muslims with the tools, the concepts, and practices, and to show the extent to which even within our language and in that is also related to practices that we engage in so far as one another, let alone in relationship to land, that we have misconstrued to those. But of course there are examples that we should draw on in so far as history with regards to not only pluralism, but advances that Muslims have contributed to across time, and that certainly are relevant to the moment that we're living today. But the political foundation of finding that interpretation, of arguing for that interpretation, that's really the focus of this book, at least, to actually establish that anti-authoritarian reading of Islam, that anti-capitalist reading of Islam. And inshallah, well, Adnan knows, vis-a-vis the PhD, that begins to expand even more, insofar as gender, insofar as queerness, insofar as the urban metropolis and how we organize space and how we conceive of even time and space within itself, outside the linear models. Right? What can we do insofar as all our relationships here, and in retrospect to also lessons that have been learned historically, insofar as collaboration and living on the land together. So both history and that foundation need to inform it, absolutely. Amen. I can ask, Please. Is there no others? Yeah, just pick up. I mean, I was gonna ask some very specific Krista's uh, question made me think. Um, you just mentioned uh, what your audience vis-a-vis -vis Islam and Muslims is to encourage them to understand some of these like broader contexts and concepts both within there and situated in a politics that, that connects it with indigenous and anarchistic uh, kind of approaches. I guess one thing I would, I would ask here is, um, what do you think, since you know, Krista mentioned that there have been parallel and similar kinds of disruptions uh, you know, in indigenous uh, experience, you know, uh, with these concepts changing, being colonized, you know, it's a very complicated situation in these be history. But what would you say that uh, your analysis of Anon authoritarian and anti authoritarian Islam can contribute to indigenous uh, struggles and um, anarchism. Uh, you know, is the reinterpretation of these concepts of Islam basically to coordinate it with similar concepts that already exist in indigenous communities struggling against settler colonialism, anarchists? Or is there anything you would say is that in dialogue 
that can assist, contribute? What does Islam offer to those struggles? Or do, you know, is it just like, it's also... It's a mutual Did exchange. Engage that way, or, you know, is there no, it has to be a reciprocal relationship, and it's based on mutual exchange, just as much as Muslims have a lot to learn from anarchists, anarchists, and many other communities have much to learn from Muslims. Right? One of the things that I point to is usul al-ikhtilaf, the ethics of disagreement. How do we engage in disagreements with one another? Usul al how do we offer hospitality to one another as migrants or as settlers towards indigenous people and vice versa? And there are a set of practices that are associated with that. Given how people get entrenched within quote unquote ideological disagreements, I don't believe that actually ideologies exist because no one doctrine or idea can speak to absolutely everything, right? The issue is the mutual exchange and reciprocity. Again, we created you from different tribes and nations so that you may get to know one another. Indigenous people can very much also value the element of Quran is a beautiful text. We have chapters in the Quran, the chapter of the moon, the chapter of the thunder, the chapter of the bees, ants that are named after non-human life. Insofar as what we have in relationship to one another, to learn from one another, insofar as our responsibilities to other than human life. Muslims contribute or constitute, certainly indigenous people, in terms of numbers and quantitatively, they're a much smaller fraction than the majority of the Muslim population that exists here. So any idea of indigenous resurgence has to draw on Muslim, black communities, and so on, for actually it to take through. Now, you don't need to mobilize all Muslims, and you don't need to mobilize again, and you won't be able to mobilize necessarily all indigenous people, because there are salats in this community and that community, and so on. But it has to be an element of mutual exchange, insofar as even ideas of spirituality, of cosmology, of religion, of faith, and the degree to which and how these factors play a role in our day-to-day -day lives. Not that they don't play a role in indigenous lives, but the element of disorganized religion, non-institutionalized religion, versus, again, versus other, other interrelated concepts of spirituality. Particularly, we're talking about one of the largest monotheistic traditions that exist in the world. So it's these kinds of exchanges. Muslims have developed entire irrigation systems in the medieval period. So how can we both learn to live off the land and engage in that exchange because particularly Muslims and their encounter that antecedent precedes 1492 with, for lack of a better word, Euro-America or with crusading whiteness or the crusading society that you term as such. Right? So there are experiences. There's the element of jihad and qital because of how indigenous history has come to be. It's not that indigenous people, with, well, we have Oka, we have many incidences and even prior in which there was a fighting back, right? But the initial refrain or skepticism or fear of using violence when we are born already into a violent world. I mean, there's a time for that. And when does violence become a tactic? Because it can never become a strategy. And how can one mobilize it, particularly in the contemporary? So I think there's something for all of us to learn from one another in that mutual exchange. Please. Yeah, and I think um, when there's a spiritual understanding of how to relate in good ways, you can have healthy relationships. And Muhammad is right. We don't have the numbers. Um, and if we try and create like healthy communities, And I think on um, like up, adding on to the practical level is that Muhammad talked about like I think not enough of my people are examining decolonization outside of the conversation within the Americas. And there is a lot to discuss because in as time sided as happened and I, you know, I don't think it worked out. <laughs> you know, I, I don't think it worked out. I think 
we have seen the recreation of Christian nation states now run by our own people uh, recreating the state and where it was. But I think if we don't have these conversations, we're going to make the same mistakes. And I think that has a lot to offer indigenous people is conversations about if this is like the last friend home, how do we not make the same mistakes that have been made in attempts at decolonization? You know? Um, and I think that's a really important conversation to have. Well, that's a great uh, dialogue they both uh, had in response to the question, so I really appreciate it. Unfortunately, our time for the moment is up. The, but some other class will probably come in here. But there is an opportunity to continue the conversation and discussion uh, uh, this evening, 7 to 9, in Macquarie B201. I hope I'll see any of you there. All that remains is really to thank all of you and to thank and join me in thanking Dr. Muhammad Abdu for this evening's presentation. Thank you.